So I looked on Wikipedia, apparently Fraunhofer was a German physicist, but in a, he died in, a, in the 1820s, and he was a, um, a glass maker, so he was making lenses, and he could, so he started, uh, and he worked in spectroscopy, basically. And so the formula, I have heard of it as the Fraunhofer formula, but uh, based on Google, it's not so clear exactly why, I mean, it is called this way, at least by some people, I don't know exactly why, and I doubt he derived it for the Schrodinger equation. Uh, now, it has to do with, um, um, well, the, the wavelength uh, in diffraction, so it's not completely out of uh, topic either. Uh, one other remark about, so I mentioned the results on bounds uh, on uh, HS uh, norms for the cubic NLS on T and R, and I mentioned, um, so my references were maybe not uh, quite right, at least uh, I forgot the, uh, the work by Capeller and Graeber, who also worked on that. And uh, finally, uh, so this is a remark that uh, Professor Zetkov uh, made to me yesterday that uh, you can, in fact, think of, say, uh, the cubic NLS on this space, uh, in, and at least I would understand it in the following way. If So these are essentially functions which are compactly supported in the first direction. These are essentially functions which are compactly supported in the second direction, and these are essentially functions which are compactly supported. So if you go far away in infinity in the y direction, then this one stands alone. And uh, the same thing holds for that one. So what you could do is to evolve this one and that one independently through your equation. And then you plug in the equation that this gives you for that one, and it gives you a, an interesting nonlinear equation in that space. And um, um, so then you can really uh, start to study it. But I, I had not really realized uh, this thing that uh, you get uh, essentially that these two are independent and they just come in as some form of potential and in the nonlinearity for this one. And uh, the, the I thought it was something nice because, uh, or at least a connection is that it's uh, connected to some outstanding problem, which is the stability of the two-line solid on 4kp2. And um, so if you have nothing to do sometime today. You can go on YouTube and you can go uh, look at uh, the lecture of, or a uh, lecture of uh, Professor Mizumachi in one of the previous workshops. When, uh, so he didn't quite talk about the stability of the two line solitons, but he has some nice pictures about them in his first slides. So uh, just for motivation. Okay, uh, well, maybe I can keep this. So now the goal for today is to start entering a bit more in the uh, study of the Schrodinger equation on uh, our space. And uh, so last time we saw some basic facts about uh, how to understand the linear flow, at least on RD. And now today we're going to uh, get, well, we'll continue with linear estimates, but uh, this time it will be streak arts estimates. And so, which are the things, the basic tools that we're going to use to extend our solutions. And so, this is, uh, no, I forgot, I think 2B. And what I would like to present is, well, I'll give you two estimates. about uh, linear solutions. Now, to state them precisely, we need to restrict to frequencies. And now you have two notions. You have two natural derivatives, the derivatives in the x direction, the derivatives in the y directions. And uh, they play somewhat different role. And it will be especially important for later. So uh, I'll uh, tell you what it is later. But this is basically the Littlewood projector on frequency capital X in the direction X, on frequency capital Y in the direction Y. And so the claim is that 
if you only integrate on an interval of time of size 1, then you can have pretty nice estimates. And uh, you can have, depending on the regularity, either in x or in y. So you can choose whatever you want. Uh, now, just a little remark about this. Uh, so first, at least this one is uh, the best that you can do in the sense that um, this should hold for very concentrated solution. And so in particular, they should uh, imply the one on uh, R3. And on, on R3, you should lose uh, one quarter of a derivative. I'm sorry, uh, what is this Q of capital X? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, you that's say, right. But, uh, no, right. you're right. So it is just something that uh, restricts your function to the frequencies that are of size capital X in uh, the uh, X dual, in the dual of uh, R, and capital Y in the dual of um, uh, T2. Well. So. f hat of c and k. And this is essentially a function which is um, essentially uh, 1 between, uh, if this is of size, uh, between 1 and 2, and then 0, if this is too far from that. So essentially, it forces c to be of size capital X, k to be of size capital Y. And so this is essentially like 1 quarter of a derivative in the y direction. And um, so here, this is not quite optimal in the sense that the total number of derivatives is one quarter plus epsilon, but at least you need to pay a price in y. So maybe you could make it one quarter minus epsilon, that I don't know, uh, but uh, you cannot completely avoid the loss uh, in y. Okay, so essentially, um, well, we'll prove the first one. And the second one is not so different. So, OK. And for the first one, because I essentially I don't want to work with this uh, projector, um, we're going to prove something slightly stronger that implies that. Uh, which is that if you forget one, di one dimension, <coughs> then you have it with no loss. And if this is true, then just by uh, taking out the uh, uh, frequencies in the uh, T2 direction, you get the other one for free. Now, this estimate is, uh, dates back to a work by Takaoka and Zetkov. And I would say it's fantastic because um, well, it's something really striking that you can estimate this norm, the L4 norm, which you could uh, precisely estimate by the L2 norm in R2. And here you have the exact same exponent on uh, something which is much less dispersive than R2. So, um, well, essentially, the first time I saw it, I found, found it hard to believe. So this is why I think we're going to prove this one. Uh, but uh, just by uh, changing a bit the proof, you could get this one in a similar way. Now, um, on the other hand, once you believe it, it's not uh, very difficult. Really. Um, so let's do it. So. Um, and what we're going to use is the fact that the L4 norm is just the L2 norm of the square. So now let's look not exactly at the square of that, but at the product of two uh, free evolutions. And because, well, well, we'll see why this is good later. Uh, so it suffices to consider, or maybe let's consider, 
we're going to take the product of two solutions and maybe let me call them phi, psi and phi and then estimate it by duality by multiplying by some function in L2. And so the idea is that this will be in L2, this should be in L2. Now let's compute that. So remember that now we're on R cross T. Uh, so, and to understand well the free evolutions, this is something much uh, easier to understand in the Fourier space. So let's write it as the Fourier transform of its Fourier transform. So this one is going to be uh, psi hat k of xi. So now I have e and e to the i t xi squared plus k squared. Well, in fact, that's just one dimensional. Um, well, I'm sorry. Maybe to fit it in one line, I'll write down the faces all together and then the amplitude. So I have c squared plus k squared, and then somehow here I have e i c x, e i k y, and then psi hat of k x c. Now this is uh, this one. I'll have to do it with the other one, e to the i. Uh, eta x uh, e to the i p y p hat p of eta h of x y t d x d y d t d x e d eta and I have forgotten two integrals. All right, so now uh, that you do that, um, you can see that. In fact, you could integrate in x, y, and t and just get the Fourier transform of your function h. So in fact, you simplify that to something like that. Of phi, no, psi, k of xi, phi p hat of theta, and then h is Fourier transform in all of the variables. So in x, I have xi plus eta. In y, I have k plus p. And then uh, the trace of the evolution is in the Fourier transform in time, which is xi squared plus eta squared plus k squared plus p squared. D xi, d eta. OK, so this is really uh, just Parseval uh, or Plancherel here. Um, but now you see that if this is a function in L2, this is a function in L2, their variables are completely independent, and uh, I would like to be able to choose any of them, then uh, I can probably do nothing better than uh, evaluate that in L2. And so And so now what I really have to do is estimate the norm of this one in L2. Now this is a little problematic at first sight because it's a function that is in L2, that means that it can, and it's in L2 of three variables, x, y, and t. And so once I fill in all of these entries, I can integrate over three guys, but now I have to, I have a fourth integral. So there has to be something in this change of variable that, um, that cancels one of the variable. All right, so uh, suffice to show. But so now you see it's really something in some sense about the Jacobian estimate. Uh, because for any L2 function, I have to estimate this by its L2 norm. So that this thing is smaller than H in L2. 
of x, y, and t. And here is, um, so, so in this generality, or uh, here is where I have to remember one thing, which is that I'm not integrating over all time, but I'm integrating only over a bounded interval. And how am I going to use that? Well, I'm going to use that in the sense that if I, uh, so instead of integrating over an interval of size one, I could integrate uh, over an interval of size epsilon for some fixed epsilon. And as a result, this, the Fourier transform in time is going to be of slow variation. And this is what I have to use. So uh, for all h, So this is, okay, so, well, let's do it. On the other hand, um, well, we'll, uh, we'll have to choose this one as one of the variable, this one as one of the variable, and then make do with what is left. So, So we're going to call this one sigma and this one uh, m. And we can take this out because those are the ones that are going to be nicely integrated directly. Uh, and then we have the left over. So sum over k integral over c of h hat of sigma m and then this thing, and I'm going to call that omega squared d sigma d uh, xi. And there is, uh, no, I guess it's, it's okay, where omega is. Well, let's see. So I have xi, and then I have sigma minus xi. So I'm going to have two xi squared minus xi sigma plus sigma squared. And then the same thing, I have uh, k and I have m minus k. So plus 2k squared up minus 2km plus m squared. And so now we have seen that the problem is that we have two integrals essentially for one variable. And the way out of this is going to be to add one more sum to that. So sum over m integral over sigma of sum over l sum over k integral over xi. Because what I want to use is the fact that this might be complicated, but in fact, this function doesn't really depend on uh, omega, or at least if I change omega by a bit, uh, the function is not going to change too much. So one, and then some, no, that's, that's it. H of sigma m omega x squared x d sigma. And now what I want to say is that, <coughs> well, in fact, this thing, I can, it doesn't really depend on omega in this interval. And so I replace this pointwise value in omega by its average on that interval. And so if I do that, I can write it this way. And so in general, this function, uh, I can only bound it by some constant times uh, its average. Uh, and then I have the supremum over L of the sum over 
of k is integral of sigma of that thing. C. Right, so at least formality is correct. Uh, now, why was that such a good idea? Um, so where we used since h hat. Let me forget about those two uh, variables slowly varying. H hat. If tau b. And so now you see how you should choose the epsilon so that at least you can make sure that this function is constant on intervals of size 1. Okay, so this you can always do, and in fact you could always do whatever the uh, width of the integral that you're choosing. But here is something that is really surprising that happens in this case. And it's something that is a nice computation. So this, I will let you do it in the error when you uh, go back home. Uh, and it is the fact that this is bounded. <coughs> of what? Well, of this quantity, two c minus sigma over 2 squared plus k minus m over 2 squared plus something and in fact sup over l sigma and m is uniformly bounded. Now what? Uh, yes. Um, all right. Some number. Um, so now, what? I'll let you prove that. Wh what is there? It's the fact that if you look, so you're integrating over uh, z times r. And so, what is this? Well, you can, for every value. For every integer value, you have one line. And what you're really doing is counting or looking at the Lebesgue measure of uh, when this quantity is between uh, L and L plus 1. And what that essentially means is that you're taking any center inside your domain and you're looking at any radius, any circle of a given radius r, which is going to be something like L plus sigma squared plus m squared, the square root of that. And you're looking at the area of your domain, so of uh, the, total, no, uh, the total length of those lines, which are between uh, r and r plus 1 over r. And the surprising thing is that this is, in fact, uniformly bounded. Here you could observe that if instead of integrating over the line, I was just integrating uh, over the whole of R2, so I would have to compute the area of this domain, then it would be no problem. Um, why is it surprising that when I integrate over z cross R, I still get something uniformly bounded? Because if I were just counting, if instead of having z cross R of, as my domain, I was trying to do the same computation, but now with all only uh, integer frequencies, then this is no longer true. And uh, in fact, you can find uh, arbitrarily, I mean, you can find, it's true on average, of course, but you can find some radius of, uh, some radius arbitrarily large such that this uh, grows like the, um, 
well, at least it grows slowly, like the div divisor are bound. Um, and uh, this is related to what Professor Procesi said, that if you look at the number of integer points on big uh, circles, then you could have arbitrarily many. And um, actually something that uh, I learned recently, which I thought was worthwhile, this, which is that the divisor bound is sharp. There is, uh, you can really saturate it with this exponential log log over log. Um, yeah. So, and now, once we've made this observation, then let's just observe that it's over, because if the supremum is uniformly bounded by one, I can just forget about it. And now um, I have this sum that becomes just an integral, and I'm in business. All right, so um, a few observations about this. First, um, well, you will tweak this in a fairly obvious way to get this estimate, except that uh, there you will have to look at the number of integer points. And this is where you get this y to the epsilon, this extra loss. Uh, second, one thing which uh, is uh, <coughs> worth uh, noticing is that we had this estimate on r cross t, and um, we did something completely trivial. We got an estimate on r cross c2 that is still uh, optimal in the sense that it is scale invariant. And so essentially the way I understand it is that the dispersion really helps you once in one direction, and uh, it helps you when you integrate in the time direction, regardless of how many uh, entries you have here. So what you can do in higher dimension is lower this exponent, because then you can try to, um, well, OK. All right. So that's it for the first estimate. Now, one thing, one last thing that I would like you to observe from this is that it implies a stronger version of it, which is a bilinear Strickhardt estimate. And maybe to make it simple, let me, well, no, let's. So this is, again, a nice exercise to, uh, a nice exercise to do. Uh, and I would encourage you to try to do it in two ways. One would be just to go through what we have been doing and then uh, use the fact that we didn't, we really had a, a bilinear estimate uh, in these guys. Another one is that this is, in fact, a, uh, in this case, a formal consequence of that one if you use Galilean invariance and uh, orthogonality properly. Uh, and, uh, well, well, uh, I guess this is always true, but it is mostly useful if, um, in this case. And what that means is that whenever you look at the product of two solutions, not only uh, can you use this estimate to bound it, but you can do better because the loss of derivative, you can always assume that it falls on the slower frequency, on the smaller frequency. What? So if y prime is equal to y, I should, would expect to see again the y to the one fourth? No, because uh, you get it twice. You should bound it by the L4 norm of it. Um, yeah. And in fact, I think, uh, as maybe uh, I, I learned, I think, uh, from um, Professor Gérard, is that just from this, you can read directly that you should be uh, locally well posed in H1 half, because uh, you can, well, just from this. Um, all right. And now I just, well, maybe let's. Um, 
let's stay here. So this is it for the uh, estimate on the linear solutions. Now, what I would like to discuss is how you can use this to pass to uh, estimate for nonlinear solutions. And here you see that there is something to be understood because even though whenever you only used the regular street arts estimate, then it's essentially clear how you're going to use them to, uh, in your nonlinear analysis because you're going to work in uh, a space of functions whose, uh, such that this norm is going to be finite. However, if you want to use bilinear strict arts estimate, it becomes more complicated because what is the space of functions such that if I take two, I have uh, a gain like that. It's probably not going to be a nice linear space. So, well, a priori it's complicated, except that you can remember that uh, you're going to produce your solutions by uh, iteration, starting from linear solutions. And so if you knew that your functions were always some form of superposition of linear solutions, then you would get that for free, and it would still be a linear space. And so this is the next thing that I would like to discuss, and um, it's what I call a functional analytic trick, a cheat. So I'm going to uh, talk about it, but I'm not going to uh, prove it. And it's uh, this fact that if you have something for linear solution, then you uh, have something for nonlinear solution. So if you can show an estimate like that, uh, so this is on your space, let me call that uh, M, so the space. And in our case, it's going to be R cross T2. So if you can get some nice estimate for product of um, uh, linear solutions, then for all initial data, um, u of zero in the ball of your space. So let me not, uh, so we try to keep it fairly general even though it's going to be false in full generality, probably. But I, I want to make a statement that is going to be true every time I'm going to use it. So uh, in the ball of size, so some constant, let me forget about it, one, uh, uh, epsilon minus one, um, in the ball, in the space H, there exists a unique solution. U of NLS, U which is continuous in your interval of time with values in your Hilbert space H and in some more complicated space um, such that U of zero equal well, u of zero. Okay. So, so in full generality, as I said, this is probably false. Um, however, uh, and I will again not prove it, but I would like to motivate it a bit to uh, get some idea where it comes from and why one could uh, hope for something like that. So, and what is the motivation for this? Uh, 
Um, well, if you remember our equation, and you can solve it using the variation of constant or the UML formula, and it's going to read something like this. So this is just the usual uh, UML formula. And so you see that better than the solution U itself, this is something that is going to evolve a lot. There is one thing that is supposed to be much more stable, and it is uh, U when you um, conjugate it by the free evolution. So when you uh, straighten it along those characteristics, or this thing that I'm going to call V of T. And so more stable. And, um, well, then maybe the equation for V becomes just and this thing I will call is something that is going to happen all the time. And I'll call that vi of the interaction of vvv. V. Or in other words, equal uh, u of 0. And now you see that to make sense of your equation, you really only have to make sense of this object. Now this is a function of t, and let's assume that you would like to hope that v is in some uh, Hilbert space or whatever. In fact, uh, you probably want to evaluate something like that by duality. So let's look at its inner product with something that is going to be in the uh, dual space of what we want. So and because we can forget about the other thing. And so now let's write what it is. It is the integral over time of uh, integral from 0 to t of e to the minus i s delta no plus to the minus i s delta v of t e to the minus i s delta v of t v of s e to the minus i s delta v of s times h of t and then there is a dt. Now I can, uh, so if I work in, say, uh, L2 or something in L2, then this is going to be self-adjoint. I can put it on the other side to get something which is a little more symmetric. And now what I can do is switch those ti two time integrations, because the only thing that at this stage really depends on t is that. And now what I just get is the integral over s of e to the minus i s delta d e of s e to the minus i s delta v of s, e to the minus i s delta v of s, and then e to the minus i s delta h of t bar, h of s, ds, where this is, or, and let's assume that we work in L2, where h of s is the integral from t of h of s ds. And now you start to see something that resembles very much what we uh, are assuming control of, and it would be exactly this if you could say that v of s is indeed very stable in the sense that uh, it doesn't change too much and that it can be approximated essentially by a constant phi, so the initial data, let's say u0, 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 
and that you have the same property for this capital H, but at least this capital H is some integral, so even if you started with some weaker information on uh, this little h, then uh, this has more chance to be true. Now, to make it into a nonlinear solution, you will have to do some fixed point argument, etc. So you think that um, you expect that one of these entries is going to be replaced by the difference of uh, one uh, uh, PKR iteration and the next. And so this is why, in general, you want to have uh, three different functions. Now, uh, and one last remark is that uh, you can also say that if this holds, then uh, at the very least, your flow, if it exists, uh, this is its third derivative at zero. Uh, and this tells you that its third derivative at zero is bounded in the space H. OK, so now where is the cheat? The cheat is uh, in saying that, um, well, that you can form spaces X that are going to do this trick. And so I think um, it started with uh, some, some work of Bourguin, and this is how we introduced the XSB spaces. What I am going to use uh, secretly uh, is more uh, some refinements of those that were introduced by, uh, I think, the Taru, and, but uh, at least that you can learn about in the uh, article that I wanted to talk about yesterday. And if I can uh, give you my personal opinion, so the XSB spaces are easier to define, but there is a cost of entry if you want to work with them. And I, my uh, impression is that it's essentially the same cost of entry that you have if you want to understand what those are and how to work with them. So, um, and for what we're going to, um, for what we're going to use today, both of these cases would work um, because we're never going to really be uh, sharp in the terms of the regularity. We can always lose a little bit. And, oh, and I just want to say one last thing about this, which is that once uh, you understand that, then it's good, but it still leaves you with some question about how to choose this space H. And there is something which is um, essentially equivalent to that, but I personally find easier uh, to uh, guess what the right space H is uh, in when you uh, to, to get some kind of estimate. And so this is the last thing I want to add, is that it suffices, so in most cases, so, uh, because it depends obviously on what this space H is. But let's say if it's uh, a Sobolev space, something which is a little bit maybe less symmetric, but uh, that I find easier. So, um, well, let's let me not repeat this. And so what you need to be able to do is to say that the two worst case, the two worst functions, I'll estimate them in L2. And then the leftovers, they are the ones that are going to define my space H. And so once you start to see this, then you start to see, for example, where H one half is going to appear. So uh, a permutation. But really this is just uh, to make it more formal, what uh, happens is that you have to estimate the two worst term, whatever that means in L2, in the weaker space. And then uh, if you can still get something bounded with the two nicer guy in your space H, you have a nice theory in H. All right. So, this was just a motivation, but I don't think I want to talk more about this. So if you have any question about that uh, or comment, uh, now is a good time to do it. Excuse me. So, so I'm just thinking about Euclidean space. For this lemma, why don't you do the regularity of x to control? 
the solution. I mean, why the first term itself is can control L for now? Uh, well, I guess we saw the proof, so that's. I see. But it seems like you should fast this too. I mean, is it because you are restricting zero one? Uh, no, so the point is that you get to choose, to some extent, which of the gradient you want to use to control your solution. Um, but certainly, the, uh, I mean, all of this is bounded by the sum of the frequency to the one quarter. This is just something a little bit more refined, and uh, it won't be important for us today, but when we start looking at this modified scattering, uh, the whole point would be to be very economical with the regularity in the torus direction, and uh, this is why it would be important for us to make sure that we only lose in one direction, where we agreed from the beginning to lose a lot, but on the, the direction where we want to have precise control, we lose as little as possible. Okay, and so now, after this, um, essentially, with one or two ideas, the, proof, uh, uh, the proofs that we're going to see today will, will rely a lot on uh, estimating things like that. So maybe let me do it once in, uh, to show that uh, you have local well poisonous in H one half. Uh, and after that, uh, I hope you will just believe me for the computations. Um, Oh, and then uh, just how much time do I have? Okay. All right, so then at least we can do. Um, yeah, at least let's do fairly well this and be more sketchy in the in the modified scattering. Um, so um, now let me say this proposition. And so you could get to one half. I just don't want to uh, be too technical. In fact, I, I would like. Uh, so, so this is essentially a consequence of what we had before. Uh, so, what we need to do is to estimate something like this. Uh, and then, so you have this uh, thing. P1, P2 minus IT delta, P2, P3, P4, Vx, Vt. And so, right. Where now um, I would like to forget about uh, this uh, distinction between the log regularity in x or the regularity in y. Uh, at this stage, I could probably do it because I'm only going to use my L4 estimate that we had before that we're only eating regularity in y. However, um, well, after that, I want to use a slight variant that has to mix both directions. So, and what is this? So, Pm. is now the same thing as before, except that it's the supremum of the two that is of size m. And it's exactly of size m. And so the integral that I have to use, we need to control the sum over all choices of m1, m2, m3, m4 of i m1, m2, and three and four, right? Because um, I can decompose my function into all of its Fourier coefficients, 
etc. And then I have to sum over all the possibilities. And uh, there is really one thing that we need to remark is that, so first of all, we can reorder them. That is a little uh, lie in the sense that some of them should have bars, some of them should not. But just by uh, changing, I mean, it won't make any difference. All of the estimates uh, that we have proved, they could have uh, bars or not. It doesn't change anything. And you could really just conjugate and uh, change the time. So once you accept this, then it is clear that we can reorder them. But there is one uh, new thing that we have to remark, is that, in fact, the two highest frequencies, they have to be comparable. And why is that? So let me just write it. Uh, and why is that? Well, just decompose this, I mean, write the Fourier inversion of all of this, and what you're going to do is to integrate, so this one would be at frequency xc1, this one would be at frequency xc2, xc3, xc4, and so, and now you integrate that over x, and so you're going to integrate e to the i xc1 plus xc2 plus xc3 plus xc4, x dx, and well, this is formal if I'm really on r cross t2, but it's really, um, you can make sense of that. And you see that this is um, going to be zero uh, unless all of the frequencies add up to zero. And now if one of them is much bigger than the three, of the three others, then this can never happen. unless two highest are comparable. And now once you know that the two highest are comparable, well, you cannot say anything about their difference. They could be very small. And so really this is the only thing that you can do in general. But the amazing thing is that this is completely um, enough for us. Because now once we observe that, then we have a product of four functions and we know that whenever we take the product of two, um, we can estimate that in L2 and things go well. And so, okay, so now, um, okay. Or maybe let me just, so assuming this order, going to be bigger and I'm going to add a, all the time group one big frequency with one small frequency. Why? Because I have seen that whenever I have a product I can always put the loss on the lowest frequency and so if I have two terms I would like to forget both of the highest frequencies. And now I'm going to use the estimate that I have, of course, just erased, but that says that I can estimate that with by one half of the derivative of the smallest. So in this case, it would be m3, and in this case, it would be m4. And now all of them are in L1, in L2. Okay, and now I would like to have an estimate like that. And I remember that I'm not working in L2 space, that would be too much, I'm working in HS space. So the two, the two worst guys, I'm going to keep them in L2, and the two lowest, I'm going to start using the information about the space. And so in particular, I can um, start adding one half derivative, but I can even add uh, S derivatives, so I'm going to have minus S here, and then 
here h s and here h s. And now that's it. So why is that it? Well, I'm going to, so those two, I only control them in, M, in L2, but they are twice the same essentially. So it's really, I can just do cauchy schwartz and then I can sum over those frequencies. Those guys, well, I have to eat them all, but they come with a negative power, so I could uh, really um, <coughs> eat them all and get something bounded by the uh, HS norm. And that would give me local existence for small data. Now, if I want to have local existence for large data, I have to produce an epsilon in front of it. But this is not something particularly difficult because at least uh, for high frequencies, this is already given directly by this estimate. So let's say if the uh, one of them, M3, is bigger than some number, I have something bounded by, as we have seen, phi1 in L2, phi2 in L2, phi3 in HS, phi4 in HS. And if I only uh, add uh, the, if I only sum over M3 with a negative power for M3 uh, big, then I, it's a dyadic series, I pick the uh, last, the first term, and I'm getting a, a to the mi uh, minus s minus one half. So what that means is that if my third largest frequency is big, then I'm good. But on the other hand, if my third largest frequency was small, then I didn't really have any evolution. I essentially just have a bounded function. And so I could just use a cruder estimate um, for M3 small, use instead and so I'm going to estimate one in And uh, then I have to gain some smallness somewhere, but wh what I gain is the time. And so I get t to the 1 half and then m3 to the 3 halves in this case times p1 in L2, p3 in L2. And so you see that if I plug that back in, I have also leads to Well, now I'm going to add those numbers all the way to my threshold a, and so I'm going to get t to the 1 half a to the 3 halves um, times the functions. And in fact, I can do it for both terms, so I could, uh, I could, get, it, I could get that twice. And so now when I add those two things, I see that at least if I choose the time small enough, well, I, I'm going to choose this one, uh, A large, to be able to produce a small epsilon, and then I'm going to, use the, the, to choose the time small enough so that I also have an epsilon here, and I'll get the estimate. Okay, so this tells you that whenever you start with an initial data in HS for any S bigger than one half, you always have a global solution. And so, you always have a local solution on an interval of time which uh, has a good chance of being pretty small. Um,
And in particular, if you start smooth, then in particular in H1, then you know you can find a uniform bound on your H1 norm, and so this gives you uh, you can gain a little epsilon everywhere here. And may, can be made global if initial data is in H1. And now what I wanted to uh, at least discuss a bit is what happens um, if you're not in H1, if your initial data is not in H1. Okay, so first this is, um, this is the end of the, the introduction saying that whenever you're in H1 half you have really a nice uh, local theory and everything can be solved by fixed points, so this is really the best possible scenario. And now the question And if your initial data is not in H1, then, well, at least you cannot really use the energy, the fact that the energy gives you a uniform bound. And in fact, we have seen that it is possible that any norm that it has is going to grow. So you have to try to do something, but still you can decompose. Uh, so you can at least make the following observation that, let's say your initial data, you can decompose it into a part. So first of all, what is the difference between H1 half and H1? Well, you're not going to see this difference for the frequencies which are bounded because uh, you're just putting a weight and uh, if xi is smaller than one, then one plus xi to the one or one plus xi to the 10 is not going to be a make a difference. So the only difference is in the tail of the decomposition. So now let's try to decompose our function into something in the bulk where the particular topology in which we estimate it doesn't really change, plus a tail. And so what we see is that the bulk gives me a nice H1 function. Um, so, and if I imagine that it, the bulk contains most of uh, the spectrum of my solution, then I could just try to truncate it. So could lead to a global solution. But of course, I, have to, I will have to correct for an error. But this error, what is going to be important for us is that it's not in H1, that would be too good, but it's much better than uh, where I can make sure that these are errors. So um, tail And so where can I make sure that these are errors? Well, when I estimate them in H1 half, or maybe with this proof in H1 half plus. And in H1 half plus, I, well, if it's the high frequencies, then just by uh, a Chebyshev argument, I can bound it by the H S norm, and I get. And so this is small for n large enough. Okay, now I have a nice perturbation theory so I can make sure that this, this um, distinction between the two pieces is going to be valid for a small time. And so what is something that could make me hopeful that by working a bit more I can uh, really uh, make it for a larger time is the fact that we have a decomposition in two guys, but both of <coughs> those guys get better in their property when S increases. And of course, if I were to reach one, then uh, it would be great because I could push N all the way to infinity and forget about this. But what that means is that at the very least, this distinction should get better and for longer and longer time when n increases. And then, um, well, at this stage, you can say, can you make it global or not? And uh, the point is that you can. So now, to make it global, 
what you see is going to be crucial is to be able to track down. Um, well, when something is going to leave the part of my solution, which has frequency n, and get in the tail to make it grow so that uh, my uh, tail, which started small, is not uh, small anymore. So to keep this decomposition, we would like to track motion of frequencies. And this is this is where you have to um, play a bit. And so I think this kind of discussion was uh, first proposed by Bourguin when he could really prove that you can make sense of this in a very strong term in the sense that you evolve this part uh, non-linearly, you evolve this part linearly, and then you can always keep some form of um, this decomposition provided S is large enough. Uh, so S is close enough to 1. And what we're going to see is some um, variant that was proposed by the I team later to say that there is a way to uh, tweak this a little bit, which is to um, not abruptly uh, remove the tail uh, by uh, using the uh, so-called I method. And so what is this? So is that we would still be able to uh, track down the bulk of our energy this way, but we need to be more gentle with the tail. And we would like to use in the best way possible the fact that we're working in HS. So um, so instead of looking at the projector, which uh, would essentially means that um, we're only looking at our function multiplied by that, or the way I would think about it, um, no. uh, we're going to look at a multiplier, which is, well, let me draw it. So we also want something that is, that gives us the same uh, information in the bulk, but we don't necessarily want to enforce um, that it becomes zero uh, too fast. We instead want to enforce the fact that it decays at infinity, like, uh, so what is it? like this. And so now, once you know that you want your function to be uh, below this curve, so below 1 for the first n frequencies and then decaying slowly so as to make sure that it remains in uh, uh, pretty smooth, then you essentially have uh, one unique way. And so we And as we're going to see, one other way to look at it is that instead of looking at your solution, so um, you're going to look at the solution uh, this times u. And so they call that multiplier i because it's some form of integration. And when you know that i u, when you have good properties for bounds on i u, the information that this gives you for u is that um, so if you if i u is bounded, then u is below the following envelope.
Um, so u is going to be uh, iu divided by that. And so as a result, you have very good control on your solution for the first Fourier modes. And you have worse and worse control as your frequency becomes larger and larger. But somehow you want to make it to compensate it uh, by the fact that as your frequency gets larger and larger, because you're away from the space where you had a nice perturbative theory, you also get some smallness from that, from there. And observe that this is much better than if you had enforce uh, your solution uh, to only have control on this times your solution, because this would give you that your solution, that if you have control on, of p to the n times u, then your solution is, you only know that it is below this envelope. And so here, there is a, a way that it could go to infinity too fast for it to be under control. And now the last um, preliminary remark is, well, how are you going to control your solution? And this is a way um, so to uh, get started the process that uh, at least uh, Professor Vichilia talked about and uh, maybe also uh, Daniel talked about is um, how are you going to um, control your solution? Solutions uh, in HS or in fact in some norm well, you would like to say that this piece, if it was in H1, then you would use it by saying that the energy is controlled. So you want to control the HS norm, and so you want to look at an energy, and you can start by looking at something like that. And so at this stage, um, you can, now that we have U or IU, uh, you can play the same game either with, with one or the other. Uh, whenever we do estimates, we'll in fact work mostly on IU. Uh, and this is how I'm going, where I'm going to state the more precise results. But just to uh, say, see why um, another way to get to the energy. Um, le let me work with you because it is a slightly nicer. OK. And so. All right, I'll then I'll just spare you the computation. I'll just give you the last result, and then we'll see why uh, why it was better to why it is good to uh, control IU. And so, well, once you have computed it, then you get uh, you can just plug that in, and you get an explicit computation and you get this thing. Um, And then you get the same thing as above. And now I can explain uh, why this uh, gets you started with a nice quantity. So you chose i in such a way that uh, it is 1 for low frequencies. So now. Decompose all of those uh, guys. Uh, well, OK, maybe first we see that we have essentially, so we have the same guy on uh, the right hand side. And then on the other side, we have either Laplace of IU, which is a pretty scary thing because uh, we're uh, assuming S derivatives, so much less than two. Or we have three copies of IU. So this is always much better than that one. So let's focus on this one. Now, uh, we can observe that if i was 1, then this should vanish. And i is indeed equal to 1 if all of the frequencies are small. 
So now we already know that for this to not be zero, one of the guy is going to be forced to be a tail. And so at this stage, you start to gain this smallness factor. But then the amazing thing is that you get one additional cancellation because uh, if only one of the uh, frequencies were small and, the, and all the other were, uh, if only one of the frequency was, so you know that at least one frequency is big and all the others are small. And now if only one of them were small, then this would be one, this would be one, and you would have the same number of i's on both sides. And the frequency of that term would be mostly the same as the frequency of that term. So the i would fall on the biggest frequency. And so you'd get, again, another cancellation there. So for all practical purposes, you can force in this expression of four terms, two uh, terms to be at high frequencies. And then after that, it's uh, turning the crank. And I'll give you the two steps next time. Uh, and then after that, it's really just estimating carefully where those commutators uh, arise. Um, yeah. So I'm sorry if I went a bit over time. here is for s greater than or half? No, uh, the global result uh, is only for 5 over 6. Uh, and you could, but this is by no means sharp. You could uh, improve it if you were. Uh, so this is just by using this thing, the so-called first generation I method. And if you wanted, you could uh, improve it. Uh, the, the important thing for us was um, more to get something that was below 1 that was global and was no more growing. And then to say that, in fact, you just cannot do better. And, and just one last thing. It, so and in, this, uh, in all of these uh, estimates, so the L4 norm is the only estimate that we use. And so all of this would, not see the, would work in the same way if it was on the torus. Thank you.